Chapter Sixteen of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter Sixteen The Farmer and the Noses. In the neighborhood of the city of Prague there once lived a very eccentric farmer, who was reputed to be extremely wealthy. He had a remarkably handsome daughter with a pair of fine dark eyes, who was a great favorite with many students at a neighboring university. She would often chat with these when they passed her home in their country rambles, but she never showed more encouragement to one than to the other. So charming was Teresa, and so rich her father, that the name of her suitors was Legion. Teresa knew her own value well, and was not a ripe cherry ready to drop off the branch at a moment's touch. This only enhanced her attraction to her lovers, and several of them agreed upon the ingenious plan of entering her father's service during their vacation as ordinary farmhands, so that one of their number might thus find an opportunity of winning her maidenly heart. The farmer was a shrewd old man, and soon discovered their wily plot. For the future, he declared, he would only take servants who agreed to remain in his employment for at least a year, and permit him to cut off the tips of their noses if they became discontented. He, for his part, would agree that he should forfeit the tip of his own nose if he lost his temper with them. Notwithstanding this extraordinary condition, so fascinating was Teresa and the reputation of his wealth, that several of the university students entered his service. It was fine sport for the farmer, for he had the youths in the hollow of his hand. By putting upon them unexpected hardships, he surprised them into betraying discontent. He then demanded that they should pay the penalty, and ignominiously dismissed them, minus the tips of their noses. At length, however, a young student named Coranda arrived on the scene, determined to win the farmer's daughter. The conditions were fully explained to him, so that he might have no just cause of complaint if he did not comply with them. "'Remember,' said the farmer, "'that if you come, you must stay until the cuckoo returns in the spring, and if in the meantime you show any signs of discontent, you too will forfeit the tip of your nose.' "'Very well,' said the student calmly, and with an affectionate glance at Teresa, took off his coat and prepared to work. The farmer began his usual tactics. At dinner and supper he offered the young man nothing to eat, yet smilingly inquired from time to time if he had had enough. Coranda replied with gay good humor that he was perfectly satisfied, but having no intention of starving, he coolly helped himself to a piece of bread and a thick slice of meat. The farmer turned pale with anger, and asked him how he dared to take such a liberty. "'I was hungry,' Coranda replied, for I had not tasted food all day. However, he added, since you are not satisfied, and I have made you angry, I will leave at once, after having sliced off the tip of your nose. The farmer saw that he was fairly caught in his own trap, and as he had no desire to be disfigured, he declared that he too was satisfied. After this he took good care that Coranda should have his share at mealtimes. When Sunday morning came, the farmer made another attempt to put him in the wrong. I am going to church with my wife and daughter, he said. You must prepare the soup during my absence. Here are meat, carrots, onions, and the pot. You will find parsley in the garden. See that your soup is good, or you will rue it. Don't forget the herbs, he added. I like my broth well seasoned. Shortly after they had gone, Coranda began his soup-making. He threw the meat and vegetables into the pot, filled it with water, and then went off to the garden for the parsley. He found other green things in plenty but no parsley, though he searched under rose-bushes and round the borders, and made himself very hot and uncomfortable in the process. The farmer's small dog frisked round him all the time, apparently delighted by his non-success. It refused to be driven away, and yelped and barked without ceasing. Suddenly Coranda remembered that for some absurd reason or other they had named the little brute Parsley. Aho! he said, I have it now! and without more ado he killed the dog, and added it to the contents of the pot. In due time the farmer came home from church, looking very well pleased. Teresa had on a new frock trimmed with blue ribbons, 
and he chuckled with glee at the temerity of the rash student who thought to woo her. "'He's a handsome fellow,' he said to himself, "'but it will spoil his beauty when I snip off the end of his nose.' He at once proceeded to make matters uncomfortable for the young man. "'I hope your soup is good,' he said, as his wife ladled him out a steaming plateful. It tasted abominable, and was swimming with fat, but a gleam in the student's eye reminded him in time that if he gave way to temper his own nose would suffer. So he swallowed his anger, though not the soup. "'Parsley!' he cried, looking round for his dog. "'Come here! This soup is fit for you, and you shall have it.' "'It is parsley which gives my soup its excellent flavour. remarked the student with a roguish glance at Teresa, who demurely cast down her eyes. I could find none save the dog, and so I put him in the pot. On hearing this, the farmer began to scold violently. I did merely what you told me, said the youth, but if you are angry, I am ready to go, taking with me the tip of your nose. Oh, no, I am not angry, replied the farmer with a deep sigh. His face was contorted with rage, and the other servants had much to do to keep from laughing. Next morning the farmer went off to market. He would not leave either his wife or daughter at home, for he suspected them of favouring the handsome student. Before he set out he gave him his orders for the day, and in such a rude tone of voice that the young man flushed with anger. He was only to do what he saw the others doing, he was told, and the farmer added a slighting remark as to his general incapacity. Caranda sauntered round the farm, with his hands in his pockets, on the lookout for an opportunity to get even with his employer. By and by he noticed some workmen placing a ladder against an old barn, and waited to see what they were going to do. One after another they climbed to the roof, and began to take off the tiles as a preliminary to pulling down the building. Caranda lost no time in following their example. He fetched another ladder, and mounting the roof of the farmer's house, set to work to demolish this. When the farmer returned he was horrified to see that most of it was uncovered, Naturally indignant, he attacked the young man bitterly, to be met with the same smiling good humour, and an offer to leave his service on the conditions agreed upon. The farmer once more could not find a word to say, and stalked away in gloomy anger. This sort of thing went on for some weeks. Try as he might, he could not get the better of the quick-witted student, who scrupled at nothing in his determination to win Teresa for his bride. It was she whom the father at last consulted, for life was becoming a burden to him, and he was anxious to get rid of Coranda at any cost. Teresa considered a while, and there was an odd expression on her pretty lips when at last she spoke. "'Well,' said she, "'you told him that he could not leave until he heard the cuckoo's call. Take him into the meadow behind the orchard. I will hide in the boughs of an apple tree and imitate the cuckoo's voice.' "'You are as clever as you are handsome,' cried her father, with great delight, and pretending to desire a private conversation with the student, he took him into the long meadow. Teresa, of course, was safely ensconced by this time in the spreading boughs of an apple-tree. "'Cuckoo! Cuckoo!' she cried, so naturally that a robin on a neighbouring bush was startled nearly out of his feathers. As the sound reached his ears, the farmer promptly gave the young man notice. "'Very good, master,' replied Coranda. "'But this cuckoo's an early bird. I must have a look at her.' Before the farmer could stop him, he ran to the orchard, and catching a glimpse of Teresa's frock through the gnarled brown boughs, he vigorously shook the apple-tree. Down came the girl, falling into his arms, and he held her there tightly, in spite of her mild struggles to escape. "'Wretch!' cried the farmer. "'Be off at once before I put an end to you.' "'Why should I be off?' inquired Coranda, trying to look at Teresa's face, which was certainly pink enough for an apple-blossom. "'Are you angry? It's a lovely cuckoo.' "'Be gone!' shouted the farmer. "'Set my daughter free and away with you!' "'Then allow me to cut off the tip of your nose,' was the reply. And now Teresa succeeded in escaping from the arms that held her. The farmer stood aghast. "'No, no!' he exclaimed in distressful tones. "'I cannot have that, but you must leave us. "'If you go at once I will give you ten sheep.' "'That's not enough,' replied the student, shaking his head. "'Then ten cows,' said the farmer hastily. "'No, I would rather keep to our agreement,' replied Coranda, "'whipping out of his pocket a very large penknife and opening one blade. "'Teresa sprang forward with a cry of horror. "'Once more the student caught her in his arms. "'Shh!' Your father shall keep his nose, but he must give you to me for my wife. 
and he kissed her so ardently that if Teresa had any objection to make, it was not heard. The farmer now forgot everything in his rage at the young man's boldness, but in the midst of his storming the fair Teresa threw her arms around his neck and implored him not to sacrifice his nose, since she was quite willing to marry this lover. The situation was not an easy one for the poor man, and at length he allowed himself to be appeased, and admitted that Coranda had the best of the argument. There was no denying this. And as the young man would not relinquish his advantage, the farmer was forced to give a favorable answer to his suit. The wedding of the young people was celebrated very soon, and Coranda invited his defeated fellow-students, who came with good grace. The farmer soon became reconciled to his son-in-law, and in due course was a great favorite with his grandchildren. If they were naughty, or appeared discontented, their father would threaten to cut off the tips of their noses, and then the old man might be seen tenderly rubbing his own. End of chapter 16Seventeen of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter Seventeen The Mouse Tower. This is the legend of the Mouse Tower at Bingen on the Rhine. Hatto, Bishop of Mayence, was rich and avaricious. Instead of devoting himself to prayer and almsgiving, he thought only of increasing his great wealth, and at a time when numbers of his people could not obtain sufficient food, his money chests were laden with gold. His farms were the most productive in the whole country, and whatever might happen to other folk, he did not seem to suffer. One spring the rivers overflowed, and the low-lying land was flooded. The harvest failed, and famine was imminent. Finding themselves on the point of starvation, the villagers went to implore his aid. "'Take pity, good bishop, on our hungry wives and little children,' they entreated. "'They die with hunger, while your granaries are full of wheat.' But Bishop Hatto only laughed. I cannot help that, he said. You must look after yourselves. And day after day he made them the same answer. My wheat is far too precious, he said at last, for me to bestow it on hungry rats. Even this, however, would not drive them off, for they were desperate, and, wearied at length by their importunities, Hatto bade them go to one of his largest granaries, which happened to be empty, saying that there he would meet them and satisfy their demands. Now at last there was joy among the starving creatures. Their dim eyes brightened, and strength came back to their shrunken limbs as they dragged themselves to the granary, in which there was soon a large assembly. "'You shall have bread to-night,' they told their little ones, and the children ceased their wailing. At the time appointed, Bishop Hatto made his appearance, accompanied by a number of his servants. His cruel lips were pressed tightly together, and the fires of hatred burnt in his deep-set eyes as he surveyed the hungry crew through the open doors of the great granary. Instead of entering it, he told his servants to pull to the doors and bar them firmly. When this was done, he commanded that the building should be set on fire. Meanwhile the hungry men and women were thanking God for having softened his heart and calling down blessings on his name. Every moment they expected to see him enter but the minutes wore on, and he did not come. One of their number threw open a window that they might have more air, and as he did so, the bishop's rage found vent in words. "'You have pestered me like rats,' he said, "'and now you shall die like rats.' As he spoke, the crackling of the flaming walls that hemmed them in made his meaning clear. Despite their shrieks and appeals for mercy, they were burnt alive, and though his servants were pale with horror— the bishop calmly surveyed the scene. When the granary was but a mass of cinders, he went back to his palace with an easy mind to enjoy his luxurious dinner. That night his sleep was broken by queer little sounds, as if rats and mice were scampering over the floor, and nibbling at something they had found. 
Next morning he was annoyed to find that the splendid portrait of himself in his bishop's robes, which had been painted by a famous artist at great expense, was lying on the ground, gnawed to shreds. He could see the mark of the rat's sharp teeth on that part of the canvas where his face had been, and in spite of himself he shuddered at the sight. A few minutes later one of his servants burst in to tell him that a vast number of mice and rats were approaching his palace from the ruins of the granary. "'They are coming in this direction with all speed, my lord,' he said with bated breath, and a panic of terror seized the man who had committed so evil a crime. Mounting his horse he went off at full gallop, but though the brute was fleet and he spurred him on unmercifully, the bishop found that the army of rats was gaining upon him. With wild terror he hurried down to the riverside, and jumping into a little boat, rode with all his might towards a tall stone tower built on a rock in the middle of the stream. Entering this with what haste he could, he quickly barred the door and crouched down in a dusty corner. He was safe, he thought, for a time at least. What was his horror presently? on peering through a narrow slit in the stone walls, to see that the rats and mice had devoured his horse and were now swimming across the river. The current was swift and strong, but they gained the tower, and though he had barred the window he could hear them climbing up the rough stone wall in all directions. He heard them gnawing at the doors and windows, and the poor starved people whom he had caused to perish did not suffer half what he suffered then. They were in at last, and sprang at him fiercely. He beat them off by the score, he trampled them under his feet, he tore at them savagely with his hands. All to no purpose. He might just as well have tried to beat back the ocean. The rats surged against him like waves breaking on a cliff, and very soon the bishop was overwhelmed in the horrid flood. Little was left to tell of the tragedy when his servants plucked up courage to enter the building some days later. This is the story of the Mouse Tower near Bingen on the Rhine, which is still pointed out to strangers as the place where Bishop Haddo met his death. End of chapter 17。18。of Folk Tales from Many Lands。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter 18 The Four Seasons A Bohemian Folk Story Which Has Been Retold in Many Tongues There was not a prettier cottage on the borders of the forest than that which was the home of Claire and Laura. A beautiful rose-tree clambered all over the little house, thrusting its clusters of small pink blossoms through the open windows, and nodding to Claire as though to say, "'You are as sweet as we are, and the sun shines on us all.' The roses did not nod their heads at Laura, for she was as ugly and wicked as Claire was lovely. Her face wore always a heavy frown, which her mother's reflected for Laura was her favorite child, and she could not bear to see that her second daughter, for whom she had no spark of love, should be so much the more attractive of the two. Nature had been very kind to the little Clare. The roses had given their delicate coloring to her soft cheeks, and her pretty eyes were just the hue of a purple pansy. The red of the crimson berries that glinted among the evergreens when winter came was not more vivid than that of her lips and her hair had the sheen of yellow corn when the sun is smiling on it. Laura could not look at her without a pang of envy, and longed to drive her away from home. One bitter day in winter, when a waste of snow surrounded the cottage and frozen icicles hung from the roof, Laura asked her mother if Claire might pick some violets in the woods for her. "'Violets!' exclaimed the mother. "'At this time of the year? Why, you must be dreaming, child! There is not a single flower in all the forest!' But Laura insisted that Clare should be sent to seek for the flowers, and loath to refuse her anything, her mother did as she was asked. "'Do not come back without them, or it will be the worse for you,' Laura called from the doorway, as she watched her little sister go shiveringly down the pathway that led to the forest. In its depths, she knew, there lurked gaunt grey wolves, and these were fierce with hunger. Clare knew this, too 
and her heart was faint with fear as she passed through the grove of fir-trees. A cheery little robin hopped down from one of the branches, and sang a few bars of his winter song as if to comfort her. She had gone but a few paces further when she saw the red of his breast repeated in a glimmer of ruddy light in the distance. She hastened towards it, and found it came from a huge fire, round which were sitting twelve strange men. The faces of all were kindly, but while three had long white beards and snowy garments, three had golden beards and long green garments, three had auburn beards and yellow garments, and yet another triplet, with long black beards, were dressed in violet. One of the three whose hair was frosted looked up as she approached. "'May I warm myself at the fire, kind sir?' she asked him timidly, and making room for her at once, he asked her why she wandered in the forest in such bitter weather. "'I was sent to pluck violets for my sister,' Clare explained, "'and I dare not go home without them, or she would be very angry.' At this her questioner turned to one of the three men who were robed in purple. "'Violets are your concern, Brother May. Can you not help the poor little thing?' he asked. "'She will be frozen to death otherwise, for to-night will be colder than ever.' "'To be sure I will,' said Brother May, laying a gentle hand on Clare's fair hair, and taking the staff from the white-haired man, he poked the fire. This was the signal for a most marvellous change in the forest. Ice and snow disappeared, and the air became soft and balmy. Birds sang in the branches overhead, and flowers sprang up as if by magic round the path which Clare had trodden. She filled her hands with fragrant violets, and thanked the brothers for their help. "'You are welcome, dear child,' they cried, and the old man took back his staff again, and in his turn poked the fire. Once more it was winter, and Clare hastened home to the cottage as quickly as she could. Both Laura and her mother were surprised to see her, for they had made sure that she would lose her way. Laura snatched at the violets only to toss them aside, and was so unkind for the rest of the day that Clare sobbed herself to sleep. Next morning she was again sent out in the snow. This time it was to seek wild strawberries in the forest, and her sister's look was so full of meaning as she said, "'Do not come home without them!' that the poor little maiden trembled with fear as well as with cold as she entered the gloomy wood. The same friendly robin fluttered across her path, and following the direction in which she flew, to her great delight she saw again the ruddy glow of the fire. The twelve strange men were still seated around it, and Brother January took her by the hand. "'Why are you here again, poor child?' he asked her gently. It would surely be wiser for you to stay at home while King Frost reigns over the land, for you are young and tender, and his grip is very cruel. "'I had to come, sir,' Clare explained. "'My sister said she must have strawberries. We gathered some in June last year.' Brother January turned to a companion dressed in flowing yellow. "'Strawberries are your concern, Brother June,' he said. It isn't for you now to come to the aid of our little friend. "'I will do so with pleasure,' said Brother June, taking the staff held out to him, and giving the fire a vigorous poke. At this the winter disappeared, the trees sprang into full leaf, and crimson berries were seen amidst the creeping tendrils of the strawberry plant. Clare gathered as much of the sweet fruit as she could carry, and once more thanked her friends with a grateful smile. "'You are welcome,' they cried in chorus and as Brother January took back his staff, the winter once more spread its mantle over the earth. Instead of being grateful for the delicious fruit that Clare had brought her, Laura was more vexed than ever to find that she had not been eaten by wolves. Her mother, too, looked at the poor girl angrily, and sent her out to the barn, as if she could no longer bear the sight of her. Clare was barely awake next morning when she was told that she must go to the forest and bring home some apples for her sister Laura, who had a fancy for them. "'But it's so dark, dear mother,' cried Clare in terror. "'Make haste and go,' was the only answer, and as quickly as her numbed fingers would allow her, Clare finished her simple toilet and started on her way. The robin was still asleep, with his head tucked under his wing, but a tiny wood mouse poked out his head from his nest in the foot of a hollow tree, as he heard her footsteps upon the frozen snow. "'If you walk straight on, you will find your friends,' he squeaked and Clare thankfully followed his directions. 
Before long she was warming herself before the glowing fire, and the brothers were asking, with much sympathy, why she had been again sent to face the cold. "'Apples?' cried Brother January, when she had told them. "'Ah! It's your concern now, Brother September!' Forthwith September poked the fire, and lo and behold it was cheery autumn, and the ground was strewn with crimson and russet leaves. A tree of wild apples close beside her was laden with fruit. Brother September turned to the child with a kindly smile. "'Gather two of them,' he said. Claire picked two of the largest and finest, and when she had done so, September handed back his staff to January. He stirred the fire, and ice and snow reappeared. Laura made no effort to disguise her disappointment when Claire brought her the two apples. She ate them, however, and finding their flavor most delicious, commanded her to fetch her hood and cloak. In spite of all that her mother could say to dissuade her, she declared that she would go to the forest and gather some for herself. "'I shall find much finer ones than those you brought me, you greedy creature,' she said to Claire as she flounced away, refusing her gentle offer to go with her. The sun shone brightly on the sparkling snow, and she took the same path that her sister had done. The robin glanced at her from his bright dark eyes, but he did not attempt to sing. He was frightened by something he saw in her face. It was the spirit of greed and envy. After wandering about for some time, and to her great disgust, finding nothing whatever in the way of fruit, Laura at last caught sight of the fire, with the twelve men sitting round. Without a word of greeting she pushed her way into their midst, and held out her hands towards the glowing embers. "'What do you want?' asked Brother January, somewhat nettled by her rude manners. "'Nothing from you,' she answered roughly, scowling as she spoke. The old man poked the fire in silence, and the sky grew dark, a heavy snowstorm began to fall, and Laura tried in vain to make her way home again, for the great flakes, dropping silently one on another, made the path she had come by impossible to tread. She stumbled at last into a great drift, and was soon buried in its depths. Her mother grew more and more anxious about her as the day wore on, and when afternoon came set out to seek her in the forest. She also found her way to the glowing fire, and pushing aside Brother January, just as her daughter had done, proceeded to warm her hands. When asked what she wanted, she gave the same rude answer, with the same result. The old man poked the fire, and the snow fell swiftly and silently. Very soon she, too, was buried in a glistening bank, and Claire had neither mother nor sister left. With all their faults she had loved them fondly, and it would have been lonely for her in the cottage now, if it had not been for her friends of the forest. As each month of the year came round, one paid her a visit, bringing flowers or fruit or glorious crimson leaves. The white-bearded men alone came empty-handed, but these sat with her beside the fire, and told her wonderful stories of winter in many lands. In the course of time she became a good and beautiful woman, and wedded a prince from a distant shore. End of chapter 18of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter 19 The Golden Fish. A fairy story very popular with Russian children. Upon a certain island in the middle of the sea dwelt an old man and his wife. They were so poor that they often went short of bread, for the fish he caught were their only means of livelihood. One day, when the man had been fishing for many hours without success, he hooked a small goldfish, whose eyes shone as brightly as diamonds. "'Let me go, kind man!' the little creature cried. "'I should not make a mouthful either for yourself or your wife.' and my own mate waits for me down in the waters. The old man was so moved by his pleadings that he took him off the hook and threw him back into the sea. Before he swam off to rejoin his mate, the goldfish promised that in return for his kindness he would come to the fisherman's help if ever he wanted. Laughing merrily at this, for he did not believe that a fish could help him except by providing him with food, 
The old man went home and told his wife. What? she cried. You actually let him go when you had caught him? It was just like your stupidity. We have not a scrap of bread in the house, and now I suppose we must starve. Her reproaches continued for so long that though he scarcely believed what the fish had said, the poor old man thought that at least it would do no harm to put him to the test. He therefore hastened back to the shore and stood at the very edge of the waves. "'Golden fish! Golden fish!' he called. "'Come to me, I pray, with your tail in the water and your head lifted up towards me.' As the last word was uttered, the goldfish popped up his head. "'You see I have kept my promise,' he said. "'What can I do for you, my good friend?' "'There is not a scrap of bread in the house,' quavered the old man, "'and my wife is very angry with me for letting you go.' "'Don't trouble about that,' said the goldfish in an offhand manner. "'You will find bread and to spare when you go home.' And the old man hurried away to see if his little friend had spoken truly. Surely enough, he found that the pan was full of fine white loaves." "'I did not do so badly for you after all, good wife,' he said, as they ate their supper. But his wife was anything but satisfied. The more she had, the more she wanted, and she lay awake planning what they should demand from the goldfish next. "'Wake up, you lazy man!' she cried to her husband early next morning. "'Go down to the sea, and tell your fish that I must have a new wash-tub.' The old man did as his wife bade him, and the moment he called the goldfish reappeared. He seemed quite willing to grant the new request, and on his return home the old man found a beautiful new wash-tub in the small yard at the back of their cabin. "'Why didn't you ask for a new cabin, too?' his wife said angrily. "'If you had a grain of sense you would have done this without being told. Go back at once and say that we must have one.' The old man was rather ashamed to trouble his friend again so soon, but the goldfish was as obliging as ever. "'Very well,' he said. A new cabin you shall have. And the old man found one so spick and span that he hardly dared cross the floor for fear of soiling it. It would have pleased him greatly had his wife been contented, but she, good woman, did nothing but grumble still. "'Tell your goldfish,' she said next day, "'that I want to be a duchess, with many servants at my beck and call, and a splendid carriage to drive in.' Once more her wish was granted, but now her husband's plight was hard indeed. She would not let him share her palace, but ordered him off to the stables, where he was forced to keep company with her grooms. In a few days, however, he grew reconciled to his lot, for here he could live in peace, while he learned that she was leading those around her a terrible life. It was not long before she sent for him again. "'Summon the goldfish,' she commanded haughtily, "'and tell him I wish to be queen of the waters and to rule over all the fish.' The poor old man felt sorry for the fish if they had to be under her rule, for prosperity had quite spoiled her. However, he dared not disobey, and once more summoned his powerful friend. "'Make your wife the queen of the waters!' exclaimed the goldfish. "'That is the last thing I should do. She is unfit to reign, for she cannot rule herself or her desires. I shall make her once more a poor old woman. Adieu! You shall see me no more!' The old man returned sorrowfully with this unpleasant message, to find the palace transformed into a humble cabin, and his wife in a skirt of threadbare stuff in place of the rich brocade which she had worn of late. She was sad and humble, and much more easy to live with than she had been before. Her husband, therefore, had occasion many times to think gratefully of the goldfish, and sometimes, when drawing in his net, the glint of the sun upon the scales of his captives would give him a moment's hope, which, alas, was as often disappointed that once again he was to see his benefactor. End of chapter 19「twenty of Folk Tales from Many Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. The Shepherd and the Dragon. A Servian Tale. 
On a lofty mountain in Serbia, surrounded by his flock, sat a humble shepherd. The valley beneath him was veiled by a thin white haze, through which he could just see the tips of the stately beeches, on which the frost had already laid his crimson touch. Only the contented munching of the sheep on the close-cropped grass, and the trilling sweetness of a lark's song high up in the blue, broke the placid stillness of the scene. The shepherd stretched himself yawning, and gazed at the sea and sky. He had nothing to do just then, and little to think of, for his life flowed on in an even course, and though he often wished that something would happen, he had never been disturbed. He was gazing dreamily at the cottage beyond the sheep pens, where his wife was busy preparing his dinner, when he saw a dark form gliding stealthily through the grass towards a big bare rock. It was followed by another, and yet another. They were finely marked serpents with glistening scales, and each bore in its mouth a curious root, with which it touched the rock. More serpents still approached, and did the same until suddenly the great rock fell asunder, showing a long passage in the ground, into which the serpents glided one by one. In his eagerness to see what they were after, the shepherd forgot his shuddering dislike of the venomous creatures, and pressed boldly into the rocky gallery. Soon he found himself in a large grotto, lit by the gleam of the many precious gems that lined its walls. In its centre stood a magnificent throne of gold, set with emeralds and sapphires, and coiled upon this was an enormous serpent with gleaming eyes. The other serpents gathered round in complete silence, as the shepherd gazed in open-mouthed wonder, the great reptile closed his eyes, and immediately all were asleep. The shepherd seized the opportunity to wander round the grotto, examining the jewels with which it was so richly encrusted, and wishing that he could carry away some in his pocket. Finding it impossible to detach them, he thought he had better depart before the serpents awoke, and so he made his way back through the long passage. But the entrance was closed, and he could not get out. Oddly enough, he felt no alarm, and returning once more to the grotto, laid himself down beside the serpents and fell into a deep slumber. He was roused by the consciousness that the snakes were stirring. Opening his eyes, he saw that all were gazing with heads erect at their grim monarch. "'Is it time, O king? Is it time?' they cried. "'It is time,' he answered after a long pause, and gliding down from his throne, led them through the grotto back to the rock. It opened as he touched it, and every serpent passed slowly out before him. The shepherd would have followed, but the snake-king barred his way with an angry hiss. "'Let me through, I entreat you, O gracious king,' begged the shepherd. "'I shall lose my flock if I leave it longer, and my wife will be waiting for me at home.' "'You entered our sleeping-place without an invitation, and now you must stay,' replied the king. But the shepherd pleaded so earnestly for his release that he was moved to clemency. I will let you go this time, he said, if you give me your solemn promise that you will reveal our hiding-place to no one. The shepherd was quite ready to do this, and three times in succession he repeated after the serpent king the words of a solemn oath. This done, he was allowed to pass out of the rock. The chestnut trees in the fertile valleys were now a mass of star-white blossoms, and the bleeding of the lambs told him that spring had come. Greatly bewildered, he hurried towards his home, rather doubtful as to what reception his wife would give him. As he approached the cottage he saw a stranger standing by the door, and stepped into the shadow of a bush, that he might wait unseen until he had gone. "'Is your husband at home?' inquired the man, as the shepherd's wife, looking pale and thin, answered his loud knock. "'Alas, no,' was her mournful reply. "'I have not seen him since last autumn, when he left me to tend his flock on the mountainside. I fear the wolves must have devoured him.' And covering her head with her apron, she burst into tears. Touched by her distress, the shepherd now came forward. "'I am here, dear wife,' he told her joyfully. The woman immediately stopped her weeping, 
and instead of bidding him welcome, began to scold with a frowning face. "'Where have you been, you lazy fellow?' she demanded. "'It was just like you to leave me to get through the winter as best I could. Answer me at once!' The shepherd could not do this without breaking his oath, and there was something so strange in his manner, as he tried to parry her questions, that the curiosity of the stranger was aroused. "'Come, come, my good man,' he said. "'Tell your wife the truth, and I will reward you with a piece of gold. "'Where did you sleep through the winter's nights? "'And what have you been doing?' "'I slept in the sheep-pen,' began the shepherd, "'and the stranger burst into a scornful laugh. "'You need not fancy we are foolish enough to believe that,' he said. "'Out with it, man. We can see you are hiding something.' "'Thus pressed, the shepherd reluctantly confessed the existence of the grotto, "'and the stranger—' who happened to be a magician in disguise, forced him not only to guide him thither, but to reveal the manner of entrance. A root that a serpent had discarded lay at their feet, and on touching the rock with this, it opened immediately and let them through. The magician coveted the splendid jewels that lined the walls of the grotto as much as the shepherd had done, and conned through the book of spells that he drew from the fold of his garments to see if it would tell him how to gain possession of the rich store. "'I have it!' he exclaimed. "'I shall now be rich as the heart of man can desire, "'and you, good shepherd, shall share my wealth.' "'Replacing his book, he was about to set fire "'to a small pellet which he produced from his pocket, "'when he was interrupted by a terrible hiss. "'Unseen by the intruders, the king of the serpents "'had followed in the form of a green dragon, "'and now reproached the shepherd with much violence "'for having broken his oath. "'His rage was so great that the shepherd thought his end had come. "'Throw this over his head,' muttered the magician in his ear, handing him a rope. Despite the trembling of his hand, the shepherd made a cast which was successful, and as the loop encircled the neck of the king, the rock burst asunder with a loud report that echoed from hill to hill. The next moment the shepherd found himself flying through space on the back of the green dragon. Such was the speed at which the wings of the fiery creature clove the air, that the rushing of the wind in his rider's face was painful to endure. They went over mountains and over seas, over desert lands where sandstorms raged and vultures lay in wait for the fainting camels, until at last they came to a wide plain watered by many rivers. The dragon flew higher and higher until the shepherd grew dizzy and lost his breath. His eyes were closed, but in the blue sky above him he could hear the sweet, clear notes of a soaring lark. "'Dear bird!' he cried. "'Thou art precious to thy master, who made us all. Fly up to him, I pray thee, and beg him to send me help in my sorry plight.' The lark flew up to heaven as he had bidden her, and returned with a green leaf from a tree in paradise in her tiny beak. Gladly she dropped this on the dragon's head, and as it touched him he fell to the ground and became once more a crawling serpent. When the shepherd regained consciousness he was on the mountainside, with his flocks around him, and his faithful dog at his feet. The forest was still in its autumn glory of yellow and gold, and in the distance he could see his wife beckoning to him from his cottage door. "'I must have been dreaming,' he said, as with thankful heart he went home to his dinner. He lived to a ripe old age in peace and quietness, and never again did he wish that something strange would happen." End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of Folk Tales from Many Lands。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kalinda. Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask. Chapter 21. THE TWO BROTHERS, A SLOVAK FAIRY TALE This is the story of Joska and Janko, two brothers who were as unlike each other as night is unlike day. Each was tall and straight, with handsome features and thick dark locks, but while Joska was mean and selfish, Janko had a kindly disposition and a generous heart, and never saw a fellow creature in distress without trying to help him. Their father was very poor, and as years went on, and he saw no prospect of his circumstances mending, he thought that the time had come for one of his sons to seek his fortune. 
as was only to be expected. He felt that Yoska could be the better spared. So, giving him his blessing, he bade him depart. Yoska was glad to leave home, for he hated work and was an idle fellow. Now, at least, he thought to himself, as he set off gaily, his pockets bulging with the cakes that were his mother's parting gift, I can please myself as to when I get up. There will be no rising early in the winter time to look after the cows or feed the chickens. I can do just as I please all day. Having walked a long distance and crossed a mountain, he came to a wide prairie, shaded here and there by luxuriant trees. Seating himself under one of these, he drew out some of his cakes and gobbled them down like a greedy child. "'Won't you spare us a morsel, kind sir?' asked two little ants, running over his hand. He shook them off roughly with an angry snarl. "'Not a crumb,' he said, putting out his foot as though to crush them. "'You are not very generous, Yoska," cried the tiny creatures as they hurried out of his reach. "'When you want our help, you will go without it.' "'Wait till I ask for it,' was his retort and he munched his cakes more greedily than ever. Soon after, he resumed his walk and came to the banks of the river, where a little fish lay panting on the rough earth. "'Won't you help me?' he cried. "'Put me back into the river, and I will bless you, for I must perish if I stay here.' Yoska's only reply was to kick it aside. Nevertheless, with a great effort, the fish managed to jump back into the stream. "'Cruel youth!' he cried. "'You will never prosper. "'No fish will help you in your hour of need.' "'Yoska paid no more heed to the fish "'than he had done to the ants, "'but marched straight on. "'By and by he reached a spot "'where four roads crossed, "'and here a group of goblins were quarrelling angrily, "'striking each other with puny fists "'and contorting their tiny faces "'into queer grimaces.' Without attempting to pacify them, or even to find out what was the matter, Yoska pushed them aside. This made the little men so angry that they stopped their quarrel to reproach him for his callousness. "'You are a selfish fellow,' they squeaked, "'and nothing that you do will prosper!' This prediction was well fulfilled, for though Yoska travelled over many countries and met men and women of all sorts and kinds, he did not succeed in making his fortune, and returned to his home as poor as he had left it. His mother, good soul, said nothing, but his father upbraided him for his want of success, and grieved to think that now he must part with Yanko, since he could not find food for both. "'Never fear, dear father,' said Yanko tenderly, as he thanked him for the phial of magic fluid he had just received as a parting gift. "'If I do not make my own fortune, I will make yours, and you and my mother shall live in comfort for the rest of your days.' He started in high spirits, whistling a merry tune as he swung along, and stopping now and then for a moment to admire the rich deep blue of the sky or the cunning nest of some little bird. When he became weary, he seated himself on a cushion of moss by the roadside and began to eat the loaf of bread which was all that his mother could afford to give him when he bade her farewell. He was soon surrounded by a troop of ants. "'We are hungry also,' they cried. "'Will you not let us share your meal?' "'Willingly,' he answered, scattering crumbs with a liberal hand. "'Good Yanko!' they exclaimed, as they bore them away to the ant hill. "'If you ever want help, you will know where to come for it. "'We are your friends from this time forward.' Yanko felt inclined to smile at the idea of being helped by such tiny creatures, but he was far too kind to hurt their feelings, and thanked them gratefully for their promise. Towards the close of the afternoon he reached a still blue lake. A ray from the setting sun made a pathway of gold across it, and fell on a poor little fish that lay on the bank with quivering sides as it panted for breath. Without waiting to be asked, Yanko immediately picked it up and put it back into the water. "'Good fellow!' it gasped, ere it disappeared beneath the shining stream. "'If you are ever in need of help, call on the fish, and some of us will come to your rescue.' Yanko laughed to himself as he went his way but he was glad that he had happened to pass the lake at the right moment. The birds were singing their vesper hymn, and the landscape was flooded in rose-colored light as he neared the four crossroads. The sound of squeaking, angry voices made him hasten his steps. "'What is wrong, little people?' he asked, in his gentlest tones, when he came up with the same goblin crowd whom we have met before. "'You are surely not going to quarrel on such a lovely evening. 
Shake hands and make friends before I wish you good night. The goblins' frowns and grimaces changed into merry smiles as they patted each other on the back and declared they were only pretending. "'You are a very good fellow, dear Yanko,' they said, just as the fish had done, "'and whenever you need our help, you have only to call us and we will come.' Yanko trudged on happily until he came to a town, where he was distressed to find the inhabitants in the deepest grief. The daughter of their good king, whom all adored, lay at the point of death. The court physicians had wrung their hands, declaring they could not cure her, and signs of mourning were in every face. Yanko listened to all they had to say, with never a word in reply, and then entered the nearest inn. "'I would talk with your master,' he said to the buxom maid who came forward to ask his pleasure. When her master appeared, Yanko drew him on one side, and begged him to make his way with all speed to the palace. "'Bear word to his majesty the king,' he said, "'that a great physician awaits his summons.' "'A great physician?' echoed the landlord, looking curiously at the slim youth who stood before him. "'I am the greatest physician in the world,' declared Yanko solemnly, "'and can cure the princess, if his majesty will allow me.' So saying, he retired to the parlour of the inn, and the landlord hurried to the palace. The king received the news with joy, and sent an escort at once for Yanko. "'Sir Doctor,' he said, as he received him in the great audience chamber, whose walls were of pale green marble with a ceiling of pure gold. If you can cure my beloved daughter, you shall have her hand in marriage and any other reward that you may demand. Yanka was then ushered into the room of the sick princess, and when he saw her exceeding loveliness, he desired nothing better than to become her husband. Her hair spread over her pillows like a mantle of woven sunbeams, and her heavy lids veiled eyes of the purest violet. Her slender hands were as fair as lilies, and her dimpled chin looked fit for an angel's kiss. Lifting her head on his strong young arm, he parted her unconscious lips, that he might give her some of the precious fluid with which his father had entrusted him, for he knew that this was the water of life. The first drop revived her. At the second she stirred faintly, and at the third she opened her violet eyes. Seeing a stranger bending over her, and that stranger a young man, she drew back haughtily, and demanded of her attendants what he was doing in her room. "'He is the greatest physician in the world,' they murmured, "'and will quickly cure your royal highness of your sad sickness.' But the princess declared that she did not wish to be cured, and obstinately refused to swallow any more of the water of life. It was only at her father's tearful entreaty that she at last consented to do so and when she heard, on her recovery, the reward that the king had promised, her maidenly indignation knew no bounds. "'If I break my word to this great physician,' her father pleaded, "'my people will no longer have faith in me. I pray you, dear daughter, give way to me in this one thing. He is a comely youth, and will make you a good husband.' The princess had ever been a loyal and devoted daughter, and seeing the justice of her father's plea, she at last consented to marry Yanko, provided that he carried out three conditions. "'Whatever you ask me, that I will do,' declared the enamoured youth, and the princess did not look so very angry as she met his ardent gaze. Calling for a sack of cinders and a sack of grain, she mixed these thoroughly together, strewing them on the ground. "'If you can separate the cinders from the grain before the first sign of dawn, I will be your wife,' she said, and left the room with her maidens." Yanko saw at once the difficulty of the task, but in spite of this he did not despair. In order that he might think in peace, he repaired to a green field, where he threw himself down under a spreading oak tree and knit his brow in a puzzled frown. He was hardly seated when a number of ants ran over his foot. "'Do not look so perplexed, dear Yanko,' remarked their leader. "'You were kind to us when we were hungry, and now we will serve you equally well.' With this they trooped off to the palace, and by the time that Yanko returned, the grain and the cinders were neatly separated and replaced in their respective sacks. The princess did her best to appear disappointed, but in her heart she was not ill-pleased. "'You have fulfilled my first condition,' she said ungraciously, "'but the second and third are more difficult. Fetch me the largest pearl in existence.' Yanko bowed and left the palace, feeling this time at his wit's end. 
Without thinking where he was going, he wandered on until he came to the lake. The little fish popped up its head and asked why his face was troubled. "'If it's a pearl you want, my friend,' he said, when Yanko had told him of the second condition that the princess had made, "'I can bring you the finest that is to be found.' He darted down to the bed of the lake, and a moment later returned to the surface of the water, holding in his mouth the largest and most lustrous pearl that Yanko had ever seen. Having thanked the little creature warmly, the youth returned to the palace, and now the princess permitted herself to smile. "'It is lovely, indeed,' she said, as she bound it in the gold of her hair. "'What shall I bring you next?' asked Yanko tenderly, venturing to take her hand. She did not draw it away until he had raised it to his lips, when she told him, in mischievous tones, to bring her a rose from Hades. That night he walked for many miles under the starlit sky, for his heart was sick for love of the fair princess, and he could not think how he was to get that rose. If he had only known that she too was sleepless, it would have cheered him greatly, though he already guessed that she was not so indifferent to him as she would have it appear. While still musing on her loveliness, he reached the spot where he had seen the goblins. To his surprise he found they were still there, and before he had time to speak they had swarmed around him. "'Tell us how we can help you,' they cried in chorus. "'We know you are in trouble by the way you stare at the moon.' When they heard of the wish of the fair princess for a rose from Hades, they bade him not despair, but wait at the crossroads until the magic hour of sunrise." As the mist on the hills turned from grey to purple, and the first thrush raised her morning song, the eldest goblin reappeared, and laying a crimson rose at Yanko's feet, told him that he had had some difficulty in finding it in Hades, since it was the flower of hope. He had plucked it from the breast of an old, old man, who had learnt to see that good might come out of evil, even as dawn from night. Yanko carried the rose to the palace, and when the princess saw it, she very sweetly gave him her hand. Yanko had no need to press her to fulfill her promise, and at the marriage ceremony, which shortly after took place amidst general rejoicing, she was the most willing of brides. The bridegroom's parents and his brother Yoska were all three invited to the wedding, and when the latter heard how Yanko had won his beautiful bride, he realized that selfishness does not pay, and that even the smallest and meanest of creatures may sometimes be of service. End of chapter 21《of Folk Tales from Many Lands》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kalinda《Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter twenty two The Three Lemons A Turkish Fairy Story A certain Sultan had a son of whom he was justly proud, for the young man was handsome and gay of temper, and had never been known to do an unworthy action. In the circle of the court he was the brightest star, and very sweet were the glances thrown him by the high born ladies who served the Sultan. The prince was courteous to them all, but he favoured no one, and as years went on, and he showed no signs of taking to himself a wife, the sultan became disturbed. "'My son,' he said, "'why do you not choose a bride? It is time you were married, for I should like to see you the father of children before I go to my rest. Surely it would be easy to find a mate amidst these fair women you see around you. I should experience no difficulty were I in your place.' The young prince looked at him thoughtfully. "'I must have something more than any of them can give me, my father,' he replied, "'and if you really wish me to take a wife, I will go on a long journey, perhaps even round the world, and seek a princess whom I can love. She must be fair as the morning, white as the snow, and as pure as an angel.' "'Well said, my son,' replied the sultan. "'I wish you good fortune and a safe return.' and without more ado the prince departed. The air was crisp with frost, and the glittering crystals of the snow threw back the radiance of the sunlight from bank to meadow. 
the waves that tossed and tumbled on the distant shore seemed to beckon him towards them, so he hastened to the coast, where he found a splendid vessel resting at anchor. While he was yet wondering how it had come there, and whither it was bound, invisible hands drew him on board, and as his feet touched the deck, the anchor lifted and the ship set sail. For three days and three nights it glided swiftly over the sea, steered by a shadowy pilot who spoke no word. On the morning of the fourth day it came to stop beside a little islet, and the prince was amazed to see his favorite horse issue from the hold, ready saddled and bridled. Concluding that he was expected to land, he led the horse on shore, and when he turned around to take another look at the ship, it had completely vanished. No sign of any habitation was to be seen, and the cold was so intense that he could scarcely hold the reins. In spite of this he rode on and on, till at last he reached a small white house that stood by itself on the top of a hill, unsheltered from the wind. He knocked at the door with eager haste, hoping for the glimpse of a fire and perhaps some food. His summons was answered by a venerable woman with scanty hair like wisps of snow, who stared at him inquiringly. "'I seek a wife, good mother,' said the prince. "'She must be the most beautiful princess in the world, and as good as she is beautiful. Can you tell me where to find her?' The old woman half shut the door. "'You will not find her here,' she said for I am winter, and this is my kingdom. My sister Autumn, perhaps, may help you, but I have no time for thoughts of love. You will find her if you go straight on. The prince thanked the old lady, and remounted his horse, hoping that Autumn would at least give him rest and refreshment. After a while he found that the snow had disappeared, and that luscious fruit now hung in clusters from the trees. The stubble of the corn tinted the fields with gold, and the squirrels were busily engaged in storing nuts for the winter. A little further on he came to a small brown house beside a wood, and again dismounting he knocked at the door. It was opened by a woman with abundant dark hair and eyes like sloes. Her cheeks were ruddy, and her look was kind. She did not, however, ask him in. "'What are you seeking, young man?' she inquired in a gentle voice. "'I seek a wife,' he answered briefly. "'Ah!' she exclaimed. "'Then I cannot help you. "'My name is Autumn, and I am far too busy gathering fruit "'to have time to spare for such things as love and marriage. "'My sister Summer is full of dreams, "'and she may find you what you want.' "'So saying, she shut the door, "'and as there was nothing else for him to do, "'the prince resumed his journey. "'He noticed ere long, that the grass by the roadside was very tall, and that the fields were heavy with corn ready for harvest. The air was so warm that it touched his cheek caressingly, and the sun shone down so hotly that he was fain to unloose his coat. He was very glad when at last he saw a small yellow house shaded by a group of trees. As he knocked at the door he heard the sound of a distant waterfall and the hope of quenching his thirst was more in his mind just then than the fairest wife in Summer's kingdom. His summons was answered by a stately woman crowned with auburn tresses. "'I am sorry I cannot help you,' she said, when he had told her the object of his journey, "'for I too am very busy. Hasten you to my sister Spring. She is the friend of lovers, and will surely aid you.' So the prince went on till he saw a little green house in a bower of lilac. Hyacinths and violets, jonquils, narcissi, and fragrant lilies of the valley bloomed beneath the windows, and when he knocked at the door, a little lady with flaxen hair and eyes of soft, deep velvet appeared on the threshold. "'Won't you take pity on me?' he asked her eagerly. "'Your sisters sent me on to you. I seek a wife who must be fair as the morning, white as the snow, and pure as an angel from heaven.' "'You ask a great deal,' Spring told him smilingly. "'But I will do my best for you. "'Come in and rest. "'You must be tired and hungry.' "'And to his great delight "'she ushered him into a long, low room "'filled with the scent of flowers. "'When he had feasted on bread and honey "'and quenched his thirst with sweet new milk, "'she brought him three fine lemons on a crystal tray. 
Beside them was a handsome silver knife and a quaint gold cup of a rare design. "'These are magic gifts,' she said, "'so guard them carefully. "'Return at once to your own home, "'and make your way to the great fountains in the palace gardens. "'Having made quite sure that you were alone, "'take your silver knife and cut open the first lemon. "'As you do so, a lovely princess will instantly appear "'and will ask you to give her water. "'If you at once offer her some in this golden cup, "'she will stay with you and be your wife. "'But should you hesitate,' Even for the space of a second, she will vanish into thin air, and you will never see her again. I am not likely to be so foolish, said the prince. But if I do, shall I have no wife at all? You must then cut open the second lemon, Spring answered gravely, and exactly the same thing will occur. If you hesitate this time also, and she too disappears, you will have one more chance with the third lemon. Should your wits fail you a third time, you will die without a mate." The prince would have thanked her for her kindness, but she waved him away with a smile and a sigh, telling him not to delay. Full of joyful anticipation, he rode once more through the kingdoms of summer, autumn, and winter, and when he arrived at the coast found the same stately vessel awaiting his pleasure. The wind was favorable on his homeward voyage, and in a very short time he had once more gained the precincts of his father's palace. Giving his horse into the care of a groom, he hurried into the great gardens, and when he had filled Spring's gold cup with water from the splashing fountains, cut open the first lemon. He had no sooner done so than a most exquisite princess appeared before him, and with a timid glance asked him to give her water. "'I am thirsty,' she murmured. "'Will you not let me drink from your golden cup?' The prince was so lost in admiration that he could only gaze at her, and with a gesture of reproach the lovely maiden vanished." It was in vain that he lamented his stupidity. Do as he would, he could not call her back again, and with many regrets he cut the rind of the second lemon. Once more the gleaming spray of the dancing fountains took the form of a beautiful girl. "'Fair as the morning and white as snow,' cried the prince in rapture, too delighted to heed her request for a cup of water. He did not regain his senses until she also had disappeared." when he again bewailed his neglect of Spring's injunctions. With trembling fingers he inserted the silver knife into the third lemon, and as the pungent odor of the golden fruit escaped into the air, another princess appeared before him. Closing his eyes, lest they might be dazzled by her exceeding beauty, he immediately offered the golden cup. The maiden raised it to her lips with a bewitching smile, and drained it to its dregs. The prince laughed aloud for joy. Now at last he had found the bride he sought. No summer morning was fairer than she, for the whiteness of snow gleamed on chin and brow, and her expression was pure and gentle as an angel's. Drawing her down beside him on to a flowery bank, he held her hand and looked into her eyes. "'Will you be my wife?' he whispered, and to his delight she answered, "'Yes.' When his first raptures were over, he noticed with some disappointment the simplicity of his bride's gown. It was of some simple stuff, the color of running water, and hung in long flowing folds round her lissom form. No necklace broke the outline of her dainty throat, and she looked so different from the maidens of the court that the prince, who, after all, was only a man, and not perhaps a very wise one, felt that something was lacking to complete her beauty. "'Your robe is not worthy of you, dear love,' he cried. "'If you wait for me here, if I will fetch you one of rich white satin from my father's palace, and a rope of pearls to twine around your neck. But the princess knew she needed no ornaments to enhance her beauty, and she did not wish him to leave her. Her lover, however, was so insistent that she consented to stay by the fountains while he went home, and more in love with her than ever he hurried away. Now the princess was very timid, and as the prince tarried long she grew frightened of being alone. So she stretched out her arms to a tree above her, and swung herself up, that she might nestle amidst its branches. The foliage hid her slender limbs in their flowing draperies, but her exquisite face gleamed like a flower from a setting of glossy leaves, and was mirrored in the deep basin of the fountains. An ugly negress, who came to fill her pitcher, caught sight of its loveliness, 
and since she had never gazed into a mirror, believed it to be her own. "'Oh, how very handsome I am!' she murmured. "'I am far too beautiful to do the bidding of any mistress. I will never draw water again.' And flinging the pitcher from her, she strutted home with the air of a peacock. "'Why have you come back empty-handed, Deborah?' inquired her mistress. "'I have seen my face in the fountain,' was the reply, "'and I am much too lovely to fetch and carry like a poor slave.' "'Why, you are as ugly as sin,' her mistress retorted sharply. "'Go back at once and do as you are told.' Deborah fetched another pitcher and went back to the fountains, grumbling the while. Again she caught sight of the prince's face reflected in the water, and again her swarthy features became distorted with pride. "'It is true,' she cried. "'I am lovely as a dream. I will marry a prince and live in a palace.' With this she threw down the second pitcher, and flounced into her mistress's presence with such an assumption of dignity that that lady burst out laughing. "'If you only knew how ugly you are,' she cried, when she could speak, "'you would never talk such ridiculous nonsense.' and daring her to return again without the water, she handed the mortified woman a third pitcher and sent her back to the fountain. The flower-like face of the fair princess smiled back at the angry negress as she bent over the pool, and the poor creature grinned and ogled. "'But I am handsome!' she cried triumphantly, "'as handsome as a queen!' She spoke so loudly that the princess heard her, and her laugh rang out like a peal of bells. Looking hastily up, the negress saw her in the branches, and disappointed vanity rendered her almost speechless. Her mistress was right, then, after all, and the lovely vision she had seen in the water was not the reflection of herself. As she stared upward with dilated eyes, there came to her thoughts of revenge. "'I will make her suffer for this,' she murmured, but wreathing her wide lips in a false smile, she bade the princess good morrow. "'Why do you hide in a tree, lovely lady?' she asked her gently. "'I am waiting for my prince, who has gone to fetch me a satin robe and a rope of pearls to twine round my neck,' answered the princess shyly. "'Your golden hair has been tossed by the wind,' remarked the negress. "'Let me come up beside you, and I will make it smooth. It will not do to look untidy when your prince arrives.' "'How kind you are,' said the princess, and as she bent her silken head toward the negress, the treacherous woman stabbed it with a long, sharp pin. The princess fell back, faint with pain, but before her body could touch the ground she turned into a snow-white pigeon and flew off, uttering plaintive cries. The negress took her place in the tree, and when at last the prince appeared, bearing a satin robe and bridal veil, it was she whom he saw looking down on him. "'Where is my sweet princess?' he asked. "'She is fair as the morning and white as snow. "'What have you done with her?' "'Alas, dear prince,' answered the negress sadly, "'while you were away an enchantress came "'and changed me into my present form. "'When you have proved your love by making me your wife, "'I shall, in three days' time, "'once more become a fair and beautiful princess. "'But if you desert me, I must remain forever hideous.' "'Although the sight of her filled him with repulsion,' The prince was a man of honor and would not break his word. Calling the ladies who were waiting in the carriage, which he had brought to convey his bride to the palace, he bade them array her in the satin gown, and, pretending not to see their astonishment and disgust, drove back with her to his father, introducing her as his promised wife. The sultan was naturally horrified at her appearance, but when the prince explained to him how matters stood, he agreed that he must marry her and hope for the best. While the father and son talked thus, the negress wandered over the palace, giving unnecessary orders to the servants and making herself hateful to all. She even ventured into the great kitchens, and commanded the chief cook to prepare rich viands for her wedding ceremonies. As she issued her orders in a loud, harsh voice, she passed by the window, and noticed a slim white pigeon sitting on the sill. "'Kill me that bird!' she cried, "'and cook it for my supper.' Not daring to disobey her, the chief cook killed it immediately, plunging a sharp knife into its snowy breast. Three drops of blood fell from the window cell into the courtyard, and a tiny seedling sprang from each of these. As if a fairy had waved her hand, they grew into trees of fragrant blossom, and in an instant the blossom turned into golden lemons. 
Meanwhile the prince was seeking for his bride, for since he had set himself so distasteful a task, he wished to perform it well. "'She is in the kitchen, your royal highness,' he was informed by one of his shocked courtiers, and in going to meet her the prince passed under the lemon trees. The sight of their fruit brought him a ray of hope, and gathering three of the finest that he could, he hastened with them to his own room, where, having filled the golden cup with water, he plunged the blade of the silver knife into the rind of the first lemon. As before, a beautiful girl appeared, and stretched out her fair hands for the golden cup. "'Ah, oh, no!' he cried. "'You were very charming, but you are not my princess.' He cut the rind of a second lemon, and as he did so the second princess took form before him. He shook his head at her mute entreaty for a cup of water, and she too disappeared. Then he cut the rind of the third lemon, and, lo, his princess was once more in his arms. Great was the joy and relief of the old sultan when he heard from the prince that this beautiful girl was his real bride, but he listened with a frown of anger as she told them all that had happened when her lover left her by the fountain. He ordered the negress to be immediately brought before him, and, regarding her very sternly, asked her what she would think a fitting punishment for an affront offered to the future wife of his dear son. "'Nothing less than death,' declared the negress, "'and death by burning. Let the offender be cast into your majesty's oven, and the great door shut.' "'Madam, you have passed sentence on yourself,' replied the sultan dryly, and, shrieking with terror, the negress was led away. But the sweet princess would not let her suffer. "'She is but a poor, ignorant woman,' she said, "'and it must be sad to be so ugly. Set her free, I entreat you, and let her go.' This is the boon I ask you for my wedding gift. The sultan could not refuse his new daughter's first request, and the prince regarded her fondly. I saw you were fair as the morning and white as snow, he murmured, and now I know that you are sweet as an angel. And though the years to come brought him trouble and sorrow as well as joy, he was indeed blessed. Beloved of all, that his princess wielded a gentle sway, and he never saw the fruit of a lemon without sending a grateful thought to spring for the magic gifts by which he had fared so well. End of chapter 22please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kalinda Folk Tales from Many Lands by Lillian Gask Chapter 23 The Bar of Gold Long years ago there lived a poor laboring man who never knew what it was to sleep in peace. Whether the times were good or bad, he was haunted by fears for the morrow and this constant worrying caused him to look so thin and worn that the neighboring farmers hesitated to give him work. He was steady and frugal, and had never been known to waste his time in the village inn or indulge in foolish pleasures. In fact, a worthier man could not be found, and his friends agreed in saying that he certainly deserved success, though this never came his way. One day, as he sat by the roadside with his head on his hands, a kindly and charitable doctor from the town close by stopped his carriage to ask him what was the matter. "'You seem in trouble, my good man,' he said. "'Tell me what I can do to help you.' Encouraged by the sympathy in his voice, Weeping John, as he was called, poured out his woes, to which the doctor listened with much attention. "'If I should fall sick,' the poor man finished by saying, "'what would happen to my little children, and the wife whom I love more dearly than in life itself?' They would surely starve, for even as it is, they often go hungry to bed. Surely a more unfortunate man has never been born. I toil early and late, and this is my reward. And once more he buried his face in his hands, while bitter sobs shook his ill-clad shoulders. "'Come, come,' said the doctor briskly. "'Get up at once, man, and I will do my best for you. I can see that if you do not kill worry, worry will kill you.' Helping the poor fellow into his carriage, he told the coachman to drive straight home, and when they arrived at his comfortable mansion, he led him into his surgery. "'See here,' he cried, pointing to a shining bar in a glass case, 
That bar of gold was bequeathed to me by my father, who was once as poor as you are now. By means of the strictest economy and hard work, he managed to save sufficient money to purchase this safeguard against want. When it came to me, I too was poor, but by following his example and keeping a brave heart, in cloud and storm as well as sunshine, I have now amassed a fortune that is more than sufficient for my needs. Therefore, I will now hand over to you the bar of gold, since I no longer require it. Its possession will give you confidence for the future. Do not break into it if you can avoid it, and remember that sighing and weeping should be left to weak women and girls. The laborer thanked him with much fervor, and hiding the bar of gold beneath his coat, sped joyfully homeward. As he and his wife sat over the fire, which they were now no longer afraid to replenish, he told her all that the good doctor had said, and they agreed that unless the worst came to the worst they would never touch that bar of gold. "'The knowledge that we have it safely hidden in the cellar,' said his wife, "'will keep from us all anxiety. And now, John, you must do your best to make a fortune, so that we may be able to hand it on to our dear children.' From that day John was a changed man. He sang and whistled merrily as he went about his work, and bore himself like a prosperous citizen. His cheeks filled out, and his eye grew bright. No longer did he waste his leisure in lamentations, but dug and planted his little garden until it yielded him richly of the fruits of the earth, and the proceeds helped to swell the silver coins in his good wife's stocking. The farmer, who had before employed him when short of hands, was so impressed with his altered looks that he took him permanently into his service, and with regular food and sufficient clothing John's delicate children grew strong and hardy. "'That bar of gold has brought us luck,' he would sometimes say, blithely to his wife, who held her tongue like a wise woman, although she was tempted to remind him that the luck had come since he had given up weeping and lamentations concerning the future." One summer's evening, long afterwards, as they sat in the wide porch while their grandchildren played in the meadow beyond, and the lowing of the cows on their peaceful farm mingled with the little people's merry shouts, a stranger came up the pathway and begged for alms. Though torn and tattered and gaunt with hunger, he had an air of gentleness and refinement, and full of compassion the worthy couple invited him in to rest. They set before him the best they had, and when he tried to express his gratitude, John laid his hand on his shoulder. My friend, he said, Providence has been good to us, and blessed the labor of our hands. In times gone by, however, I was as wretched as you appeared to be when you crossed the road, and it is owing to a stranger's kindness that I am in my present position. He went on to tell him of the bar of gold, and after a long look at his wife, who nodded her head as if well pleased, he went and fetched it from the cellar, where it had lain hidden all these years. There, he exclaimed, I am going to give it to you. I shall not want it now, and my children are all well settled. It is fitting that you should have it, since your need is very great." Now the stranger understood the science of metals, for he was a learned man who had fallen on evil times. As he took the gleaming bar in his hands, while murmuring his astonished thanks, he knew by its weight that it was not gold. "'You have made a mistake, my friends,' he cried. "'This bar is not what you think it though I own that most men would be deceived. Greatly surprised, the old woman took it from him, and polished it with her apron in order to show him how brightly it gleamed. As she did so, an inscription appeared, which neither she nor her husband had noticed before. Both listened with great interest as the stranger read it out for them. It is less a matter of actual want, it ran, than the fear of what the morrow will bring, which causes the unhappiness of the poor. Then tread the path of life with courage, for it is clear that at last you will reach the end of your journey. When the stranger paused there was a dead silence, for the old man and woman were thinking many things, and words do not come quickly when one is deeply moved. At last John offered the stranger a tremulous apology for the disappointment he must be suffering through their innocent mistake. On the contrary, he replied warmly, the lesson that bar has taught me is worth far more than any money that you could give me. I shall make a new start in my life, and remembering that we fail through fear, will henceforth bear myself as a brave man should. So saying, he bade them adieu, and passed out into the fragrant twilight. End of chapter 23 End of Folk Tales from Many Lands